Please stop helping us how liberals make it harder for blacks to succeed. Author Jason L. Riley. If I were to tell you that I've taken this book around with me to several cookouts just around town uh, in political circles, and it's raised a few eyebrows, just the title alone, mm -hmm. and sparked conversation, what would you think about that? Well, I think the publisher would be happy <laughs> indeed, to hear that. Indeed, um, indeed. But no, it's not, it's not surprising. I've had a similar reaction. When I, when I went to get the jacket photo taken, um, the photographer was black, and he asked me, What's the title of your book? And it was immediate conversation starter. It does that. Mm. You touch a lot of third rails in this book. You touch a lot of third rails. Uh, you go from uh, President Obama, mm -hmm. the black president. Uh, you talk about voter ID. You even at the conclusion, uh, a third rail that you touch, and I want to get on that, talk about that a little later on, but you talk about the acquittal of George Zimmerman. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's really a third rail in the black community. Talk to me about how you have come up with these thoughts um, and, and, and brought things together for this book that typically is not thought of in the way that you've written in the black community. Well, uh, a lot of these ideas come from reading the two people that I dedicate the book to, Thomas Sowell and Shelby Steele, two uh, black conservatives both affiliated with the Hoover Institution academics who have done um, a lot of research in this area and written about it for many years. Um, and I'm familiar with their work and thought, um, you know, a younger generation of blacks should be saying the things they're saying for a new generation of readers. And, and that was part of the impetus for, for writing the book. Mm. You're an independent, and we start off chapter one, black man in the White House. Talk to me about that, Barack Obama. Well, I think Obama's presidency, his first election in 2008, was kind of the culmination of a civil rights vision um, that uh, pushed political power as a means of raising blacks in America. Um, and I think, obviously, gains were made with the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. Since then, however, um, liberals black liberals in particular, have made political power a priority, electing more black officials. And I think the Obama presidency was the culmination of that vision. And I wanted to say, so we've got that now. What do the black masses, so to speak, to use a data term, have to show for it? Mm -hmm. and, and that was really what prompted that chapter. And what I get at in there is the history of groups that have gone that route. They push political power before they push economic power. And you talk about the civil rights leaders who marched with King, the King era civil rights leaders. You talk about it being an industry. Tell me about that. Talk a little bit about that. Well, yes, I think what you have on the left today is uh, a group of individuals and organizations that are searching for relevance. I think the big battles have been fought and won. Mm. And the trouble they have today is convincing people that the problems they're calling attention to are the true problems that blacks face. And I, I think they've really become parodies of what they used to be mm -hmm. under King. Mm -hmm. um, it's as if uh, the NAACP spends its time scouring the nation for sightings of Confederate flags or white use of the N-word, saying, ah, there you go. See, nothing's changed. Don't hold blacks responsible for their socioeconomic situation today when we still have Donald Sterling's out there or Clive and Bundy's out there or someone waving a, a Confederate flag at a Tea Party rally. And I think that's a, that's, a, that's a search for relevance. I don't think those, or racism in general, is what is primarily holding blacks back today. And racism has not been the primary barrier to black advancement for some time. Hmm. Well, I want to go back to something you said. Battles have been uh, fought and won when it comes to the black community. But what do you say to the disparities in the jobless rate in this country? African Americans still, to this day, have the highest unemployment rate in this nation. Um, it's been that way since the inception of bringing us to this country. Um, also, there's disparities in education. There are predatory lending uh, situations where African Americans are targeted uh, for these loans that, that make them default or foreclose. Um, there's so many other issues out there. I mean, 
let's just say the criminal justice system as well. And that's one of the reasons why President Obama came out uh, after the George Zimmerman verdict, uh, because there is a thought and there is a feeling and there is fact to base uh, upon that African Americans are at a dis disproportionate level uh, given higher sentences for things like crack cocaine versus powder cocaine, and also uh, in jail for different things versus a white person. So talk to me about that when you say the battles have been fought and won. Well, I guess I take issue with the premise. You said that you pointed to unemployment rates mm -hmm. um, and said, for instance, that they've been that way since we came here to this mm -hmm. country. Uh, no, they haven't. Um, if you go back to uh, the first part of the 20th century, mm -hmm. um, as far back as the 20s, 30s, 40s, even into the 50s, you will see black labor participation rates higher than white labor participation rates. You will see, if you go back to census studies coming out of slavery in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, well up into the 1940s, you will see a rate of two-parent households higher among blacks than among whites. Mm. Um, so you have to look at the trends that were already in place before some of the major civil rights legislation passed. You had uh, between eight, 1940 and 1960 a 40 point drop in the black poverty rate in America. 40 points between 1940 and 1960 before a Voting Rights Act, before a Civil Rights Act. Now that trend continued after the acts were passed, mm -hmm. but at a much slower rate. At best, they were continuing a trend already in place. Well, with LBJ, we began the war on poverty, mm -hmm. and the war continues. There has been poverty. And I understand, you know, uh, you're talking about the census and, and out of slavery and, and in the 50s and 60s, but the quality of jobs, what kind of jobs? There, there's a big difference in at that time versus now when you have people in management positions, the president of the United States, mm -hmm. versus being um, in the lower end of mm -hmm. the spectrum, uh, the kind of the farming, farming jobs, agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, agrarians, um, housekeepers, things of that nature. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay. I'm talking about skilled jobs. Blacks mm -hmm. were joining the skilled professions at mm -hmm. faster rates okay. prior to affirmative action policies, which began in earnest in the 1970s than they were after those policies were put in place. Mm -hmm. Teachers, craftsmen, and so forth. Blacks were joining the professions at a higher rate prior to the passage of these policies. Again, we almost without thinking credit policies like affirmative action for helping to swell the ranks of the black middle class, increase the number of black college graduates. In fact, affirmative action has had the opposite effect. We have 40 years of evidence to look at. Uh, re regarding affirmative action policies. I'll give you a, a, a quick example. Yes. At the University uh, of California, in the, in the entire state system, uh, racial preferences in college admissions were banned back in 1996 mm -hmm. through a voter referendum. After that ban took place, black college graduation rates at the University of California rose by more than 50 percent. And that is, didn't rise in general. They also rose in the most difficult disciplines of math and science and engineering. Again, by more than 50%. A policy intended to increase the ranks of the black middle class was in fact producing fewer black college graduates than we otherwise would have had. Mm. In the book, um, you cite uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, mm -hmm. and you talk about affirmative action. Talk to me about that and, and, and how you, uh, I guess, espouse his philosophy with that. Well, again, I, I think whether you're talking about Clarence Thomas or Thomas Sowell or Shelby Steele, they'll say, mm -hmm. let's look at the track record. Mm -hmm. What is working and what isn't working? And when it comes to something like affirmative action, what the evidence shows is that affirmative action is mismatching kids with schools. And what, it, what I mean by that is that it often sets up kids to fail. It takes smart kids who might do well at a less selective school, mm -hmm. funnels them into a more selective school, and in that more selective school they're more likely to drop out altogether or switch to an easier major. A quick example of this is a study done of MIT, black students at MIT some years ago. Black students 
enrolled at MIT scored in the top 10% on their math SAT scores of all kids in the 